what they call hard luck city. A lot of them done lost their trailers. A lot of them back to living the way they was, in them old tents, living in the woods. It's tax time in the U.S. and as good a time as any to ask if our economy is working and for whom. Today on The Laura Flanders Show, Stacy Mitchell, co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance, and Esteban Kelly, the new co-executive director of the U.S. Federation of Worker-Owned Co-ops on the rising movement for real alternatives. And then a filmmaker gets access to the private gatherings of oil company executives five years after the BP drilling disaster, and we get a glimpse of her film, The Great Invisible. All that and a few words on corporate crime taxes and the cost of doing business big business's way. Welcome to our program. Hi, I'm Laura Flanders. Syriza, an anti-austerity party with close ties to its local solidarity economy movement, recently won power in Greece. Could that happen here? What will it take before we in the States have a mass movement that is offering economic alternatives? Our next guests are in the trenches of that struggle, and they have some ideas. Stacy Mitchell is co-director of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance and directs its Communities Scaled Economy Initiative. She's the author of Big Box Swindle, The True Cost of Mega Retailers and the Fight for America's Independent Businesses. Esteban Kelly is an educator, community organizer, and a member of AORTA. That's an anti-oppression resource and training alliance a worker-owned cooperative devoted to strengthening movements for social justice and a solidarity economy. He's also featured in Own the Change, the new video produced by us at Grit TV and the toolbox for education and social action, TESSA. Welcome to the program, both of you. I'm so glad we get a chance to check in on the state of this movement. Is it a movement even? We'll get there. Let's start with some of the good news. I read in The New Yorker recently that the statistics are pretty fascinating. You've got a growth of independent bookstores up 20% since 2009. You've got craft breweries for the first time collectively outselling Budweiser. A lot of the predictions people had about how big was going to overwhelm small don't seem to be completely playing out. How would you describe where we are? Uh, Stacy? start with you. Well, we're, we are starting to see this great uh, counter trend that's happening all across the country. You know, in, in addition to those, we've also seen 1,400 new small independent neighborhood grocery stores open. Uh, we've seen credit unions grow in numbers and market share. So there's a lot of signs that people out there really want to see a different kind of economy, that they really want to reclaim ownership and reroute the economy in their communities. Now, is this just desperation, people thrown out of the jobs they did have in 2008 and trying to figure out how to make ends meet? I don't think so. I mean, there may be a little bit of that going on, but I actually think this is a, a real move for people to take control of their own livelihoods again and to really have a stay over the decisions that affect their lives and also by neighborhoods and really wanting to support businesses that they know are rooted uh, where they live. And what about on the movement side, Esteban? I remember um, Bob Massey at the New Economy Coalition Conference in 2014 laid out this huge vision of a multifaceted movement going in a more progressive direction that brought everybody under the big tent of a, of a new economy. Um, are we there? Well, we're at the early stages of what we hope to become fundamental economic change and a shift. Um, I would say that we're not quite at the stage of a movement, uh, and it might be many decades before we are. What does but that mean? Well, we have some important elements in place. I think right now we have a, a series of networks uh, some of whom have been working really closely together over the last few decades and uh, really building and delving into some of these different options for how we can live sustainably, how we can meet uh, employment that is just and fair, and how we can really root uh, wealth and resources and control back into communities. Your institute produced an interesting report about the possibilities that exist for us right now in the energy sector. Yeah, it's one of the most exciting sectors uh, right now because 
you know, we've got this revolution going on with the, the ability to actually finance and, and have uh, rooftop solar in particular be very efficient and affordable for people. Um, we have a moment right now where ordinary households could really go from being energy consumers to being energy producers. Utilities are freaking out about this, you know, and big fossil fuel interests, but it's an amazing sector, $364 billion we spend on electricity every year. Um, and we could take ownership of that, and we could do it in a way uh, where not only do we shift to renewables and begin to solve the climate crisis, but we could become owners of an enormous asset and piece of our economy and benefit financially. Of course, getting there will mean that we've got to fight the utilities and make sure that our vision holds out, and it also means that we've really got to look at public policy. What are some of the obstacles that you see? I mean, obviously, there's a world of obstacles, but Esteban, if you were to name a couple, what do you think are the biggest challenges? Well, I think even just having a market-driven uh, economy for anything from energy to our food, food system, um, education, all of those things um, is really the wrong premise for getting people's needs met. Um, so. 50% of the landmass of the United States is covered with rural electric cooperatives. These are areas uh, where most rural people get their electricity having formed cooperatives. There's a whole um, National Rural Electric Cooperative Association that uh, bands together all of these areas uh, because it just wasn't economically incentivized for private companies to go ahead and do that. So people had to come together, form their, uh, form their own cooperatives, and it's now one of the largest cooperative sectors in the United States. So all those companies that are saying we did it, actually they were forced to do it by people forming cooperatives. Sure, mm -hmm. yeah. What about this question of the internet and the new economy as perceived through by many people through their phones, their apps? We've talked about Uber. Um, it does feel like a lot of ground is shifting underneath us in terms of where the marketplace even is, Stacey? Mm, yeah, it's really true. And it raises a lot of um, very challenging dynamics, I think. You know, you look at a company like Amazon, which now accounts for one out of every three items that we buy online, which is just an enormous market share. I mean, more than, than Walmart has market share in the, in the offline world. Um, just huge. And it's really become um, almost like a a utility, a platform, but it's it's not regulated as such. Um, you know, you've got all of these third third party sellers on there who are not really very well protected um, from Amazon and its ability to manipulate them to its own advantage. Um, but we see this all across where you know we've we've um, you know the ability of uh, large companies to use the web in ways that uh, drive down and extract um, value from local communities. Uh, I think it's going to be one of the bigger challenges that we face as we try to figure out how to build this new economy. You talk about the big swindle. Can you yeah. just remind people what that is? Well, the big box swindle, yeah, is a book I wrote an, a, a few years ago about the rise of large retail companies, you know, which, you know, it used to be that our economy was dominated by big manufacturers, and that's really flipped on its head now. Uh, and we've had the growth of Walmart and Target and Amazon and Home Depot and these giant retailers who are so big that they really drive um, how many of the goods in our economy are produced. I mean, Walmart now sells one out of every, f uh, accounts for one out of every four dollars that Americans spend on groceries. That means Walmart determines how food is produced in this country. And the, the swindle really there is, is that we thought we were getting a deal. You know, we, we allowed these companies to grow and indeed subsidize them through public tax dollars mm -hmm. a, a great deal. Um, on the theory that we were getting a real benefit as consumers, we were saving all this money, and what we have now realized is that we have paid an enormous price in lost income. We have lost so many middle class jobs as manufacturing has left, um, as small scale farms have been driven out, as small businesses have been driven out in huge numbers. Um, and what have these companies provided in return? I mean, very low wage jobs working in their stores. And this is a big part of what's happened to the middle class. And what I think is so interesting about the dynamic around the new economy now is that you're seeing workers and entrepreneurs coming together in new ways um, and really thinking about um, you know, how do we challenge this centralization of the economy? How do we take control back? Um, and recognizing that there's a commonality in terms of having power over your own livelihood that both workers share you know, in the labor movement as well as small business owners share in wanting to control their own, uh, their own business. It, it's an, it is an interesting phenomenon. Small business used to be really the purview of the right. Mm -hmm. um, they would always say, well, your tax legislation is going to hurt small businesses. Your environmental protection law is going to hurt small businesses. And now we're seeing some of these uh, alliances that you're talking about. What's coming of it so far? Are there outcomes that you can point to? 
I think it's a, you know, it's exciting. There's, there's, uh, there's an interesting alliance that's happened in San Francisco that helped pass uh, a couple of pieces of legislation uh, in the city uh, last year. Um, it was a, an alliance of uh, locally owned merchants uh, group that represents independent retailers um, and the local chapter of Jobs with Justice, which is a labor-oriented group. And they came together really to look at the retail economy, big low-wage sector, um, and they passed two pieces of legislation, one that gives neighborhoods uh, the ability to restrict chain stores from opening and really keep their neighborhoods local and independent. Um, and the other was a bill that gives retail workers a lot more protections on the job. Um, and that was really a small business and labor alliance that did that. And I think, you know, it's not just that they have a common enemy in terms of these big companies, but they both have a stake in how do we build a more humane economy mm -hmm. where it's not this kind of drive to ruthless efficiency and everyone is crushed in the process, you know. So is this moment comparable to any other in our history, Esteban? Um, as you see it, it seems to me we had to we had to organize to get some rights for workers under industrial uh, capitalism. We're trying to preserve some rights for local retailers and for local communities under big box retailism, if you want. We're now dealing with this World Wide Web. It's almost like that's summoning a whole nother set of organizing principles. Yeah, and I think that there are a lot of analogs to the late 19th and early 20th century where people built a lot of power. A lot of that was around fighting for their own rights and, and contesting uh, power for just having some basic dignity, whether that was in communities of color uh, or organizing around labor. And I think we're seeing another version of that happening now. So the fruits of that might not be visible for several decades to come. Mm -hmm. um, but there are analogs. If you look at the, the really early years of civil rights organizing, of labor organizing, some of those kinds of strategies are coming into play. I think what's different, uh, and it's a fundamental difference that's important, is that the whole premise is, 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 uh, has shifted. It's not about assuming and conceding a certain amount of concentration of power and wealth and just fighting for a fair, uh, a fair slice of that. It's really shifting things and saying, actually, people should be the center of our lives, of our economy, of our communities and that everything that we do economically needs to be uh, rooted in ecological limits mm -hmm. and what is gonna um, really serve the people and the land that we're on. And that part of that transition to even get to that place mm -hmm. needs to be considerate of all the injustices and extraction and displacement um, that has happened to get us to the place we are now. So how so do that, we get there? Yeah. And do we get there through this localism strategy? Local could be parochial to some people's mind, way of thinking, right? Mm, yeah, I mean, I think it's, you know, it's a spectrum. You know, there, there are going to be, you know, there are regional economies and there are ways that we are interlinked and that there is going to, you know, that we need to focus on, you know, fair trade uh, and ways in which we, we bring whole regions up um, and we deal with these enormous inequities that happen, have happened geographically mm -hmm. within our cities, across race. I mean, all of those things, you know, need to be addressed, but I think, you know, localism is not necessarily parochial in, in the sense it's really about how do we bring that power down to the grassroots level and how do we begin to think about um, empowering ourselves to, you know, work in our own communities. I think the real question right now, um, you know, when you, when you look at what we, we talked about at the very beginning, this renewal, this renaissance of small-scale enterprise and local bookstores and craft breweries and grocers and farmers markets and everything that's going on out there is whether what is a, a consumer movement at this moment can become a citizen's movement. Can it become a political movement? And that's where we really have to go if we want to make big change at a scale. So you look at something like Syriza's victory in Greece and see a possible future for us there, Stacy. Yeah, I mean it's, it's really interesting to see these things happening uh, internationally. You know, I think one of the challenges that we have in the U.S. is that we're a little bit hypnotized by our economy. What do you mean by that? Well, we, we, you know, it, it, we sort of think of modern capitalism as our invention. In some ways, it was, and you know, and that it's the best. Um, and we've we've been so trained in that thinking that it's going to take us a little while to let that go. But it's really, if you start actually looking um, at the data out there, it's you know, it's really fascinating. There are a lot of studies that show that big is not more efficient. You know, I mean, we think that these big companies, that the giant banks have come to control banking, the big retailers, the big agribusiness, because they're so efficient, they do things better, they're smarter than the little guys. Right. 
But there are lots of academic studies that show that the biggest banks uh, operate much less efficiently than the small ones, that credit unions and community banks uh, have lower prices uh, on all of their products, better loan terms and the rest. We know in the case of retail that Walmart and other big companies offload so many costs that it really isn't a bargain. And on down the line, and what what you begin to realize uh, is that it's not that these companies have won because they're more efficient. They've won because they've rigged the game. They've used their political power to pass all kinds of rules and regulations that tilt the playing field and undermine communities, undermine local enterprise to their advantage. And that's really why we have to shift from, you know, from local being just about going to the farmer's market to it being a political movement about uh, changing those rules of the game. Anything you want to add to that, Esteban? Yeah, just that there does need to be infrastructure through policy as well as technical assistance, resources, um, and a lot of the barriers that are in the way that are preventing the thriving uh, local economies and translocal economies where people are learning from one another um, and replicating models that all of that stuff needs to be um, contested politically at the same time that there's a flourishing of economic democracy. I mean, I think that part of the problem is that uh, when capitalism becomes synonymous with patriotism or with America, um, as opposed to democracy, then we've seeded a lot. And so we need to really root back down in the idea that democracy is a really powerful tool and, and it's one that's worth lifting up as we envision and start building um, our future economy, one that's going to work for everybody. I've been really struck in listening to both of you and in reading your work and, and being a, around this movement, how we still talk about an economy, but when we talk to people about where they're living, how they're working, what they're doing, there are so many different economies out there. Mm -hmm. Half of the people in this country, it seems to me, are not working your standard nine to five job. Is it the picture of now that we also need to change as well as moving to something else? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of the work that we're doing in our network is really just helping to rebroadcast um, stories of what, what people's lives actually look like. Yeah. And uh, I, through the mainstream media, just, just how uh, big business has capitalized on what, are, what is the story, what are our policies, what are our laws, um, the, ma the mainstream narratives about what American economies look like nowadays um, is really off balance. And it's not telling the true story of how people are surviving, how people are making ends meet, um, and how people are innovating, really incredible ways of collaborating in communities, of living together, of working together. Um, and th that's part of the story that we are really trying to push forward and tell. I think that our imaginations are limited by not even having a sense of what's happening right now um, and being further grounded in what's happening contemporarily can help us understand what's possible for the future. Stacey, it looks like you agree. Oh, absolutely. There's so many um, innovative models out there that really could be adopted by communities across the country. And there's so much power at the city level that really goes unexercised. It's an exciting moment. There's a lot that could happen. I'm excited. Thank you both. You've got me more excited about this than ever before. We will keep on reporting on it. I appreciate both of your work and for coming into the studio. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thanks. The lights went out. And then the first explosion hit us. We were all up on the front here. I can smell that night now. That's why I've issued a moratorium on deep water drilling. You know this? Have you lost your job because of it? Somebody ought to feel something other than greed. Five years ago, the explosion on the Deepwater Horizon oil rig off the coast of Louisiana killed 11 workers and led to the worst offshore oil disaster the U.S. has ever seen. It's a disaster many have still not recovered from. Today, we look at a film, The Great Invisible. This clip shows a community on the Gulf still devastated by the economic impact of that disaster. This is what they call Hard Luck City. A lot of them done lost their trailers. A lot of them back to living the way they was, in them old tents, living in the woods, living on school buses, old, old boats. Well, I think they just living from day to day. And the state, you know, should help these people. Going to these folks' house, baby, I'd rather do this seven days a week than to do anything else. I don't get nobody gonna come out of there. 
That dog sitting up there. I don't go to their house when they, they had them dogs sitting up there, baby. Oh, they the children looking at the woman. It looked like somebody home over there today. We go over there. What's going on with you? Oh, I got a box of bananas back there. You want some of them? That's on the stove cooking. You want some of these bananas? That was a scene from The Great Invisible, a film about the aftermath of the BP drilling disaster. The filmmakers also had access to private gatherings of oil company executives. Take a look. Everybody at this table has been uh, part of the golden era of the oil industry back in the late 70s and 80s, it's which you had no faxes. You did everything by phone. Your word was your bond. Everybody made a lot of money. Everybody got spoiled. Houston got big. Everybody had uh, Texas Longhorns on, on their Cadillac <laughs> driving around. Everybody hammers big oil. What is Google? Google earns billions. Yeah, big oil gets the hammer. They get all the bad press where I think we should be thanking our lucky stars that we should have. Four dollar gas when you have yeah. when you pay for in Europe it's <clears throat> it's ten dollars a gallon. I agree, I, I'm starving. <laughs> that was a clip from The Great Invisible, directed by Margaret Brown. The film's playing this month on Independent Lens on PBS. For more on the Gulf Coast response to the Deepwater Horizon disaster, check our website. The cost of doing business, that's what corporations call it when they write off the damage they've done to people and the planet from their taxes. It's a cost of doing business, all right, a cost to us of doing business with them the way we currently do it. And it's one of the reasons that many people are calling for a whole new system. To recap, on April 20th, 2010, BP's leased rig, the Deepwater Horizon, exploded killing 11 workers and spilling oil into the Gulf. That rig kept spewing for 87 miserable days while reporters were kept at bay and the company told the public lies. Five, five years on, BP's been found guilty of gross negligence and misconduct. They've been slapped with $42 billion in fines. But the British behemoth's not only threatening now to pull out of the Gulf entirely if its fines aren't reduced, they're claiming a lot of that money back thanks to a tax loophole that enables BP to claim as much as 80% of the damages they've paid out and call it an ordinary business expense. It's not just BP either. Car makers, chemical companies, mine owners and banksters routinely deduct part of their court-ordered payouts from their taxes. That means we, the people who sustain the damage, are also subsidizing the damages. U.S. PERG, the public interest group, is petitioning the Justice Department to deny BP more write-offs. Senator Patrick Leahy of Vermont has sponsored the last in a series of bills to close the loophole. But even to talk about a loophole suggests there's an opening in a fabric that's somehow intact. When it comes to the public's contract with big business, that fabric was never stitched straight in the first place. While BP's threatening legislators and public coffers are strapped, people around this country are looking for more than reform. They're looking for a whole new system. They're talking about renewable energy, collectively owned utilities, and local, not corporate, control of their fate. There's a revolution going on right now when it comes to local power, Stacy Mitchell of the Institute for Local Self-Reliance told us. Mitchell and a slew of Laura Flanders show guests just signed on to a Next System project launched by our colleagues at the New Democracy Collaborative. There's no doubt more to come, but maybe it's time for BP to move out. The bill for the cost of doing business big business's way just may be coming due. I'm Laura Flanders. You can see all our interviews at The Laura Flanders Show and write to me, laura at grittv.org. Tell me what you think. This week on The Laura Flanders Show, what does it mean to put yourself on the line for your beliefs? Actress Kathleen Chalfont, who's known for her brave performances and her principled political stances. Art is not an amenity for the privileged. It is 
the deepest expression of the human soul. And we look at Stanley Cohen, a lawyer who's gone to jail. And there are some of us who challenge the system every way, every day. This week Revolution. on the show, Change this March the 8th for International Women's Day, the Laura Activist Flanders show brings you a global about conversation about women's human. rights and we making need to change. Measure our success with women by, leaders from uh, Afghanistan, well -being Kenya, and the Philippines, joined by well -being UCLA professor Kimberly Williams Crenshaw well, and Tony Award winning playwright Eve Ensler. War, capitalism, and more. It's all part of the feminist agenda. Watch the state of female revolution. March 8th, ACET, Link TV. This week on the show, Stacy Mitchell and Esteban Kelly. One of the challenges that we have in the U.S. is that we're a little bit hip.